Welcome to our event where John Harris will speak about his book, The Last Slave Ships, New York and the End of the Middle Passage. Dr. Harris earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and also holds, holds master's degrees in history and American history. He is an assistant professor of history at Erskine College. And he has um, worked on a number of different projects, including a digital exhibit, uh, Voyage of the Echo, um, and that's available through the Low Country Digital History Initiative. He's also um, done a, a bunch of talks and a bunch of other articles on this topic. Uh, well, without further ado, here's Dr. John Harris. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, and welcome everybody. Um, it is a special pleasure to, to speak locally. I mean, I know we're all spread out <laughs> in a way, but I've been giving talks to lots of different audiences, lots of different places, and it, it's nice to sort of come home and do a local talk. And a special plug to the Anderson County Library, I actually wrote part of this book in the library. The, the latter stages of the book were written in the South Carolina History Room. It was a brilliant, quiet space. I'd sneak out from, from home um, and get out to the library and finish the, off the polish it off and finish off the book. So this is a really uh, special connection that I've got with the library, and I'm really delighted to be able to give a, a talk on the topic. So let me see if I pull up my share my screen here. Um, okay. I think this should should work. Um, as I pull this up, let me just mention, yeah, I'm a assistant professor at Erskine. I've been down there for five years now, and I chaired the department for a while, and um, I'm really happy down there. It's a, it's a great, great spot, Erskine. So I'm actually from Northern Ireland. I should maybe mention why I talk the way I do. I'm from Northern Ireland. I was born and raised there. Um, came to the United States as an undergraduate for one year on a study abroad program, met the uh, young woman who became my wife, and uh, she's from North Carolina, and um, yeah, got a PhD in American history, and now I'm teaching American history at, at Erskine, so that's how an Irishman ended up doing an American history topic and living in, in South Carolina, so a little autobiography there. But we're here to talk about talk about the book, and I assume you can all see the screen I'm looking at. Maybe um, Mary can uh, signal to me if that's not working. But otherwise, I'll assume that you can all see um, what what I'm looking at, which is um, the front cover of the book. So let me talk about it a little bit. Uh, this is a product of a lot of work. It's the uh, my PhD dissertation. Uh, which I wrote Johns Hopkins, and then I reshaped it into a, into a book. So a lot of work has gone into this, and I'm very happy to talk about the research process if you'd like. It took me to a lot of different countries and several different languages. It was something of a detective story because what we're talking about is something that was illegal. And um, that was the transatlantic slave trade. And the slave trade was abolished in 1808 by the US Congress. That point it was illegal to be involved in the slave trade if you were an American or on American soil and yet the trade continued in very large scale and actually it was New York City it was a northern city not another not a southern city which was the you know the hub for the slave trade in its final years so you might think of the, the slave trade and think about Charleston or maybe New Orleans and that would be absolutely right to do that. But America's last slaving port was New York City. You can see it right here in the front cover. So let's uh, take a little bit of a look at all of this. You know, when I started this uh, research project, I thought that it was going to be fairly narrowly about New York. I found evidence of some illegal slave ships leaving New York in the 1850s and 1860s, half a century after abolition that I mentioned earlier. And I thought, well, let's look at New York. And I soon discovered that this was a much bigger international story. And I had to get to grips with that in order to understand what was going on in lower Manhattan. So let me lay that out a little bit. Here's the big picture. 
The transatlantic slave trade began about 1500, in the year 1500 or so, and it lasted uh, for about three and a half centuries. Now, by the about early 1800s, after about 300 years of the slave trade, that's when we see people really, um, a, a significant abolitionist effort, an effort to, to end the slave trade. Enslaved people had always resisted uh, being enslaved, and we see rebellions on slave ships all throughout the 1500s, 1600s, and 1700s. But in the early 1800s, we also see opposition to the slave trade from powerful people, from uh, you know policymakers, big political figures, some um, Christians as well, evangelicals are a big deal for suppressing the slave trade too. And so we begin to see a concerted effort to stop the trade. And it's in that context that the United States bans the trade in 1808. But it's not just the United States. Britain does the same, so does France, so does Spain and Portugal and Brazil. In fact, almost everywhere here on the map outlaws the slave trade in the early 1800s. But the slave trade did not stop just because it was outlawed. It was a very lucrative traffic, very lucrative. Slave traders in the middle of the 1800s made 90% return on their investment in slaving voyage. Slave voyage is 99 0. That's compared to 10% a century earlier when the trade was legal. Massive financial incentives to continue this heinous traffic, and slave traders did. Now, much of that slave trade went to Brazil in South America and to Cuba in the Caribbean. It didn't really go to the United States. In fact, the United States ports and the landmass of the United States wasn't really directly involved in the illegal slave trade for you know, the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. In some ways, it seemed like the United States had disappeared from the slave trade in those years. But something really important happened in 1850 down in Brazil and South America. At that point, 80, 90, up to 100,000 captives were being brought into Brazil in the 1840s each year illegally. But in 1850, Brazil got serious about suppressing that illegal traffic and they shut it down completely. A consequence of that was that most slave traders in Brazil and across the Atlantic Ocean in West Central Africa, which you can see on the map there on the bottom right, in those two places, most slave traders went out of business. But some of them wanted to continue the trade and they wanted to continue the trade uh, to, to Cuba. But they didn't travel to Cuba in order to break into the trade between Africa and Cuba. Instead, these slave traders from Brazil and from West Central Africa went to New York City. They came here. And they started a triangle which would run ships out of New York City, take the empty ships to West Central Africa, and then bring the captives to Cuba. And that was the final triangle. Maybe you've heard of the slave trade described as a triangle. This was the final triangle in the slave trade. And that's what I'm uncovering in this book, the contours of this final triangle. And it was New York and these immigrants from Brazil and West Central Africa who really ran the slave trade here in Manhattan. If you look at this watercolor painting from the 1860s, you can see um, why, or I get some hints as to why this was a great place for slave traders to operate from, is a huge city, the biggest city in the entire Americas by the 1850s when they, had, when they turned up. Good place to hide your, your operations. You can also see some busy rivers here um, that run up and down the side of Lower Manhattan, and they're chock full of wharfs jutting out into the rivers. And of course, you can see lots of ships as well. It's the biggest port in the Americas at this point, the biggest port. The slave traders had come to New York City because they wanted to 
buy up ships for the slave trade. They wanted to buy up American vessels. This was the chief market in the United States for shipping vessels. And these vessels would fly the American flag and um, they would sail out to the African coast. Let's take a look at where some of these individuals actually were in Lower Manhattan. So this is another, this is a map of Lower Manhattan kind of turned on its side. So you can see the very Southern tip of Manhattan is actually on the left of this map, the left of your screen. I have taken some of the census records and found the slave traders and plotted them onto a map from the 1850s. And that way I can show you here, and this map is also replicated in the book, where the last American slave traders, last slave traders in the United States were based. I would like you to look at the bottom left. You can see a group called Maya Ferreira, Cunha Hayes, and Figanier. These, this group, and they operated as a slave trading firm. This was the last slave trading group in the United States in American history. This group, Maya Ferreira, Cunha Hayes, and Figanier. Let's take a little bit look, a uh, little bit closer look at these individuals. The, the slave traders, the last slave traders in the United States, Maya Ferreira and Margaret Ferreira. Maya Ferreira is here on the left. So a little bit about, his, about him and his backstory. Maya Ferreira was actually born in West Central Africa. He was African. He was primarily of Portuguese descent. His father was a colonial administrator in Angola. Angola was a Portuguese colony. So his father had moved out to Angola as a, a government official, effectively. Um, and uh, his son was Maya Ferreira. And Maya Ferreira was a young man when the slave trade to Brazil shut down in 1850. And he didn't want his opportunity for wealth and status to disappear. And in West Central Africa, in Angola, that's where most wealthy people made their money through the illegal slave trade. And so that is why, as a young man, he moved from Angola to New York, and he arrived there in 1851. And he quickly met and married Margaret Butler, who's on the right. She was the daughter of a New York physician, a wealthy and respected family. And I find letters between Maya, Maya and Margaret Ferreira, husband and wife, in an archive in Portugal, in Lisbon, in Portugal. And those letters laid bare, um, in conjunction with other sources, the work that Maya Ferreira did. And most of the time, most of the letters were written by him, and he was traveling to Africa and to Cuba and to other places, arranging voyages. And he would write back in these letters that I found, right back to New York, um, to Margaret and describe uh, what he was doing. And we get a little insight into the, um, their relationship with one another and the kind of work that they did. And also the lives that they lived in, in New York. They lived in an opulent environment. And they went to balls, they went to the theater, went to the opera. Maya would send Margaret um, wealthy fur or expensive furs and diamonds and gloves and things like that when he was off in other countries arranging slave trading voyages. Um, so it, these letters were very revealing and sort of gruesome in, in their own way. Of course, all of that money coming from trafficking men, women, and children. Here's an example of a, a slave ship that slave traders like Maya Ferreira sent out to the African coast. This ship was called the Melodon. It left New York in 1854, sailed to West Central Africa. Of course, this is precisely where Maya Ferreira was from. And he was using those networks as pre-existing relationships that he had with that part of Africa to run these voyages. Now, in this case, the New York vessel, the Melodon, was captured by 
the British government. The British government were quite fiercely abolitionist and they sent naval vessels to the African coast to intercept slave ships. And they caught this slave ship Melodon off the Congo River. And what we have here is a watercolor painting of the British capturing, intercepting a slave ship. So this was painted by a British naval officer off the African coast, and it's showing us the, the role of New York in the last days of the illegal transatlantic slave trade. Here's another vessel, and this is a different vessel, an interesting one. Whenever we think about the slave trade, I imagine that you would conjure up the image of a sailing vessel one with masts and sails, just like the one we looked at a moment ago. But this is happening so late in time, the 1850s and 1860s, that shipping technology is actually changing. In some ways, we're coming to the end of the age of sail and the beginnings of the age of steam. This is the slave trade in an industrial era. And we're actually seeing some steamships, and you can see that big funnel in the middle of the ship. We're seeing steamships in the slave trade. You ever thought about um, enslaved people on a slave ship that's a steamship? That really happened in these transatlantic voyages. This vessel called the Ciceron was uh, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean several times in the early 1860s actually was enormous and it carried over 1,000 men, women and children aboard it. So this is a slave, the slave trade happening in an industrial era on an industrial scale. A reminder of how late this was going on, the 1850s and 1860s. Here's another image I find in the archives, in this case, an archive in London, the British National Archives in London. And it shows the plan of a New York slave ship called the Isla de Cuba, the island of Cuba in 1859. Again, this is another New York vessel. And you can see it's an overhead image of what the underneath, under the deck would have looked like, did look like. And you can see at the top that there are some barrels, those would be filled with water and with rice for the captives. Um, some, the seas, those four seas are coppers and those are for uh, cooking food or boilers eventually, ultimately. And you can also see some planking, long strips, those are planks and those would be built on the way over to the African coast to create a, a deck, a deck that would uh, be in the hold, it would be underneath the main deck and captives would be forced to lie upon the, this, this, duck, this deck, which was constructed um, as the ship crossed the Atlantic Ocean before it got to Africa. Here is an, an image that I found in a different archive in, in the UK in Britain, and it shows captives who had been intercepted from a slave ship. So the British had intercepted this vessel and an officer had made this sketch of, of the captives. I want you to look at the, um, there's some letters that you can see right in the center of the image and they are CR. Now these are brands, brands that had been um, forced into the skin of the captives on the African coast. And they say, this is CR, and that is Cunha Hayes. That is the business partner of Maya Ferreira. You may remember on that map a few minutes ago, we had Maya Ferreira and Cunha Hayes. So this is a stamp, effectively a brand, which demonstrates the ownership of these human beings by a slave trader based in New York City. Now, um, what is it that these captives did on a grand scale? You can maybe hear my three-year-old banging on the, on the door. This is his bedroom, so he might want to get in. Um, this is um, a map showing the routes of slave ships entering um, the slave trade from North America. And they're coming primarily from New York, from the slave traders like Maya Ferreira, but from other cities also. They're crossing the Atlantic Ocean in the North Atlantic, and they're following the wind and ocean patterns of the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic too. 
and they're being carried all the way around to the African coast. And most of them go to West Central Africa, which is where the likes of Maya Ferreira had been born and raised and had connections. Here is an image showing um, the slave trade out of Africa. So these ships, of course, made their way back across the Atlantic, most coming from West Central Africa, but from other places as well. Now, some of the vessels were intercepted mostly by the British, and you can see the arrow at the very center bottom of the, the map that's showing the interceptions and also says a little bit about where those captives ended up. And I'm happy to talk more about that if you like. Now, most of the captives that ended up in the Americas ended up on the island of Cuba. That's where the big arrow is going. This was the final place where captives arrived um, in, throughout the history of the slave trade. There are two other vessels that I'll just make note of um, that go to the United States. One goes to Georgia. That was a vessel called the Wanderer, and 303 captives ended up there. And I will refer to that a little bit later on, that vessel. Another 110 ended up in the, um, in the Mobile River in Alabama, and that vessel was called the Clotilda. But the vast majority of captives are not coming to the United States, they're coming to the island of Cuba. But just sort of um, another note I should make, I mean, this is enormous. This is not some small um, traffic that's happening at the end of the trade. It is huge. I mean, we're talking about um, you know, over 200,000 men, women, and children leaving the African coast, over 500 slaving vessels, and most of them having connections to New York City. So this is a very large trade. So I like to think this is something of a, um, of a revelation for the history of, of the slave trade, that we have an enormous slave trade happening right at the end. Difficult to uncover because it was illegal, but the evidence is out there and I tried to piece it together. Now, there were some people in New York who posed this traffic. Um, we haven't talked about it much and I can talk about it more later if you like, but there were officials who were supposed to be preventing or enforcing federal law. They were the U.S. Marshals. Uh, they did not do a very good job. Many of them were corrupt and, and uh, many of them, some of them were prosecuted for their corruption, in fact. So it certainly happened. A lot of kickbacks, a lot of officials turning a blind eye to these vessels leaving New York. But there are other people who were serious about suppressing the traffic, and one of those was Emilio Sanchez. And I'm calling him here the spy, the spy, okay? Emilio Sanchez is one of the United States' uh, most prolific, but virtually unknown abolitionists one of the most prolific but virtually unknown abolitionists. Chapter four of the book describes his story. And I don't know what he looked like. We don't have an image of him. Um, so this is why he has a silhouette in the bottom, the bottom right. But he operated for many years out of New York. I'm going to say hello to my three-year-old. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, we'll resume. Emilio Sanchez was born in Cuba, and he was also an immigrant, and he arrived in New York in the 1850s. He was opposed to the transatlantic slave trade very deeply. He operated as a merchant, and he knew the shipping world very well. He owned his own vessels. And um, he worked in conjunction with the British consul in New York for three and a half years. He approached the British consul and offered to spy on the slave traders. And he did that on a daily basis. He went down to the docks and he talked to sailors and other merchants and he entered into what he called casual conversation. He was trying to figure out what was going on. And he did a very good job of doing that. And for three and a half years, he gathered intelligence, and every few days he would pass it on to the British consul, the British diplomatic representative in New York. And the British consul in New York gathered that information and sent it to London. 
sent it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, where it was gathered by the British Foreign Office, effectively like the American State Department, but the British version. The British government, the Foreign Office, then sent that information out to the African coast, to those British vessels that we talked about earlier. And those British vessels used Sanchez's information to intercept American vessels. So was he successful? He was actually quite successful. Um, there are about a dozen documented cases that I could find of vessels being intercepted on the basis of his information. And I estimate that about 20,000 men, women and children were prevented from enduring the Middle Passage because of Sanchez's spying. Here is a document that Sanchez created. I found it in the British National Archives. It says, Memorandum of Slavers Reported. And here are the names of the vessels, the Rosita, Elias, Esperanza, further down the Antelope and the Taconi, along with the rigging, the tonnage, the flag, the port of clearance, the destination. So a description of the vessel. This is all very important so that the British naval officers would recognize the, the, the vessel when it arrived on the African coast. And then under remarks, Sanchez would describe about the history of the vessel and who owned it, who the slave traders were, when it was expected to arrive on the African coast. So this was a remarkably complete uh, documentary record and actually very helpful, not just for me to reconstruct Sanchez's story, but really this is the single largest evidentiary basis for the book. So a remarkable individual. He was getting paid for his work and he was getting paid on the basis of the captures that he made. And if you can read, read the book, you'll see what happened to him. The British government um, didn't treat him the way that they promised to treat him. He didn't get rich or even do that well at all. All the time he was risking his life. He never wrote his name, signed his name in any of his documents. He was fearful that he would be murdered by the slave traders. And he was right to be wary of that. Some other spies at this time in other places were murdered by slave traders. But he survived. And as far as I'm aware, he took his story to the grave. And hence, nobody, including his descendants, who I've been in contact with, know that he was an important abolitionist. Sanchez worked from 1858 until the early 1860s. This was the time when the slave trade was at its height. In fact, even though Sanchez did help the British to stop some slave ships, he was not able, and nor were the British able to stop the slave trade. The, um, they were not effective. The ones who were going to be effective and the people who could really end this trade were uh, the political authorities in the United States and the architect of suppression, of suppressing this illegal slave trade was the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had always been opposed to the continuation of the slave trade. He was always opposed to the illegal slave trade and he became president in early 1861 one of the first things that he did was to get serious about suppression. I mentioned a little bit earlier on that there were corrupt officials in New York. Lincoln swept them aside and put his own people in. So the new marshal in New York, federal marshal, was serious about enforcing federal law. Abraham Lincoln also instigated a treaty with the British that allowed the British easier access to intercepting American vessels. That treaty signed in 1862 made a big difference as well. And it may be the most important thing was the execution of a slave trader, Nathaniel Gordon. And here is an illustration from Harper's Weekly, an important newspaper at the time. February 21, 1862, the execution of Gordon, the slave trader in New York. Nathaniel Gordon was a slave trader born in Maine. He was a slave ship captain. He had captained several vessels which crossed the Atlantic in the 1850s and 1860s. 
One of his vessels, the Erie, was intercepted by an American naval patrol, unusually, in 1860, and carried him um, to New York, where he stood trial. Now, the laws on the books were pretty serious in the United States. The problem was that they were not being enforced. One law from 1820 said that if you were convicted of slave trading, you were sentenced to death. No one had ever been set, uh, no one had ever been executed under that particular law, but that changed in 1862. He was convicted in New York and he pled alongside his wife and about 10,000 others in New York City. They pled to Lincoln to uh, commute the sentence, but Lincoln refused to do that. And he let, um, he let the execution be carried out. There was no clemency from Lincoln. And Gordon, despite a last minute effort to poison himself, which is described in the book, he did make it to the gallows, a little groggy, but he made it to the gallows and he was hanged by his neck until he was dead. One New York newspaper called this the thunderclap, the moment when the slave trade out of New York really came to an end. At that moment, the slave traders who had flooded in in the early 1850s swept back out again. And this is when we see the end of Maya Ferreira and Cunha Hayes. They leave the United States and they are gone. Now the slave trade from the United States or US connections to the slave trade pretty much ended in 1862 and that first couple of years of the Civil War. Um, that was it. They were gone. The slave trade as a whole from Africa to Cuba continued on a small scale for a few more years. But without the support of New York, without the support of American ships, it really wasn't possible to keep it going any longer. And the last ever slave ship across the Atlantic Ocean crossed in 1867. And at that moment, the slave trade the three and a half century largest forced migration in human history was finally over. So New York and the United States had a very important role in sustaining the traffic and also when they stopped in bringing it to an end. This is the, um, the last slide really that I want to, to show you. There are some South Carolina connections here, even some local connections. I mentioned the vessel, the Wanderer earlier, the Wanderer um, crossed the Atlantic Ocean from West Central Africa to Georgia, to Jekyll Island in 1858. This was a high-speed yacht and it was not caught by the British or anybody else. It came ashore at Jekyll Island and the captives, the African captives were smuggled ashore. Some of them were sent up the Savannah River and came to um, modern day Edgefield, Aiken area. Now you may recognize the man on the left. This is Ben Tillman, one of um, you know, the most important figures in South Carolina's political history over the past 100, 150 years. Um, he was a US Senator, he was governor for a while. He was the, the key figure in the foundation of Clemson University. When um, Tillman was a young man in the 1850s, he witnessed the arrival of some of these illegally trafficked Africans on the plantation that his family owned. He saw these individuals with his own eyes. And some of those individuals, you can see with your own eyes on the right of the screen. Here they are as older people, survivors of the slave yacht, the Wanderer, Tom Johnson, Katie Noble, Ulster Williams, and Lucy Lanham. These were, um, these are Africans who arrived through the slave trade in the late 1850s, just before the Civil War. And he lived, lived all the way into the um, 1920s, 1930s, the year of the Depression, and had a direct connection to the family of um, one of the highest ranking political figures in 
South Carolina history. So it's a reminder that the slave trade we might think of as being very, very far in the past. Well, it's not so far in the past at all. Some of these individuals were living even up to and after the depression. There are clear local connections here to this traffic. And there are, of course, the obvious connections that I pointed out to New York City, the biggest city in the United States. So I guess one takeaway point is the slave trade lasted much longer than we think and in very large scale, that the slave trade is absolutely about the American South, but it is also about the North and in many ways the United States as a whole, well, slave trading was a national endeavor and one that didn't end until Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War. So I will leave it there for now. I'm very happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. So let me know what you'd like to talk about. I'd be very happy to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Um, so we will open up the floor for questions in a second. Um, I did have one question. So with all your research, what aspect was the most difficult uh, to research? Um, on, on the technical side, I think, so, you know, the languages were, <laughs> were challenging for me. There were some Spanish and some Portuguese. Um, you know, get, getting to Cuba and doing research in the Cuban archives was a logistical challenge. And um, some stories about that, for sure, it was difficult to get in and to get access to the records. And the Cuban archives are kind of falling down, frankly. So, uh, you know, not a great condition. Um, of some of the documents either but um on a i mean a more sort of emotional level if you will it's difficult some sometimes to to get deep into these documents and um you know sometimes i just had to to sort of stop and take take a break from it one thing i didn't mention was the fact that many of the captives are children and that is a pattern in this period as a trade goes on and comes you know close to an end there are more and more children who are trafficked and you know that's just you know it's difficult to to be researching this day upon day so you know there this is i think very important history and these stories need to be told but um you know it, it takes um you need to take some time away so you need to learn some coping mechanisms if you're going to spend a long long time in this work Definitely. Um, and it's a very serious subject, but something that needs to be talked about. Definitely. Um, so Raul says, please give an example of an unexpected in research, something that may have changed your opinion. Can you say it again, please? Uh, please give an example of an unexpected in research, something that may have changed your opinion. Mm. An unexpected discovery. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, hmm. Unexpected discovery. Well, I mean, you know, at the very start of this project, I did not expect, I don't think any historian would have expected New York to be so deeply involved in this traffic. I mean, that really surprised me that a Northern city was so deeply involved. Um, so that was an initial kind of um, shock of it uh, and didn't expect that and didn't, certainly didn't expect it to be in such a large, a large scale. I, I think an exciting unexpected um, thing for me was the discovery of Sanchez's letters and there are hundreds of those. So that didn't so much change my opinion, I suppose, but it was just, that was a happy revelation to me that, that there was I was, you know, there was, a, there was some information here that I was going to be able to use to piece together this traffic and something that other historians have just never really used before. So that was a, um, a happy discovery in the archives. That's a very interesting question. Thank you for that, Raul. All right. 
Um, you should be able to un unmute yourselves. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and ask your question, or again, you can put it in the chat. Um, I have a question, um, and I'm by no means a historian, <laughs> so this <laughs> might not be a great question. Um, but was there anything that you were researching where, like in the letters or anything like that referenced another primary source that you weren't able to find or you wish you could have found? Like, I don't know if someone referenced another letter or, you know, some other documents that you're just like, if only these were here kind of thing. <laughs> um, well, I can't think of a specific example of that, but it invites me to, to mention this, which is, is re related. And that is that slave traders, illegal slave traders were committing a crime and they didn't want to be discovered. So they went to extraordinary lengths to, to destroy the records. So they, they, after voyages, typically sank their own vessels. They'd bore a hole in the bottom and let it sink or they'd set it on fire when they were done. So the Cuban coastline today is littered with the carcasses of, uh, of illegal slave ships um, because slave traders tried to destroy what they were doing. They also burned their, um, their business records and accounting records too. So that made it very difficult for me to um, figure out what was going on. And so I did a lot of extra sleuthing to, to find the likes of Sanchez to see what, what was happening. Um, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen more financial records from these voyages. I managed to find financial records from about 10 vessels. And they were found in lots of different places, but able to bring them together and got a sense of who was paying for all of this and how it was working. And that's what chapter two of the book is all about. So... Yes, there's. I would love to have got my hands on those kinds of those kinds of things. And of course, the biggest missing piece in all of this, so the one that is hardest to reconstruct, is hearing from enslaved people themselves. Right? They they didn't leave as much as slave traders tried to destroy their tracks. Enslaved people were not able to leave very many first-hand records of their experiences. Now you'll see in the book that I have I have some examples of that and I begin and, begin and end the book with um, some narrative from um, an enslaved person who ended up in the United States. Um, but I always want more. Um, and so that's, I think, something that gives me a little frustration. But I've tried my best with what we have and that's, the, that's all that a historian can do when the archive presents you with silences. Okay, great. Thanks for that um, answer. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, Cheryl, I'm hope, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. She wants to know if she could get a signed copy, how she can get a signed copy of your book. The, there are some signed copies at McDowell's Emporium, which is um, about a few streets up from where I live, actually. It's um, uh, in Lindley Park. So McDowell's Emporium, they have some signed copies. Um, you can, uh, the link is showing you Amazon. I mean, it, the book I think is $13 there for hardback. So that's a bargain, I would say. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you email me, I'd be happy to figure out a time to meet at the library or somewhere else and sign it for you. Very happy to do that. My email address is harris at erskine.edu. Or you can just Google me and find my email address that way. So, you know, if you want to get on Amazon, um, you could do that. And I'd be happy to, to meet up with you. Or McDowell's Emporium, um, they have some signed copies here in town. So those are some options. That's good to know. Um, that's great. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Yolanda would like to know, and this is my question as well, what is your next project? What are you working on next? I, you know, I've been thinking about this. We've all heard of Sherman's March to the Sea, I'm sure. Sherman's March to the Sea. I am interested in telling that very familiar story 
And there's a lot of ink has been spilled about that. I'm interested in writing that story, but from the perspective of enslaved people on plantations. What did they think when Sherman and the Union Army came um, bruising, bruising through? And I think that's a very interesting story because many of them, of course, um, were, you know, freedom was coming and they, they wanted to leave the plantation and join the troops. Um, others were cautious. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot going on there. So, um, I'm interested in telling that familiar story, but from a different angle. So we'll see, we'll see if, uh, how that develops over time. Um, so we do, we're, we're very teaching focused on Erskine. So we, we spend a lot of time with our students. So I need to find some more time at the weekends at, in Anderson County Library <laughs> so I can work on that next project. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a great answer. We we do need multiple perspectives in history because too often we just hear from the one side. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions? Again, um, you can check out his book from the library. As soon as I check it back in, um, I will put my video on to show the cover of it. <laughs> um, you can put a hold on it, get in line, <laughs> get in line for your copy, um, buy it yeah. at McDowell's um, Emporium, buy it on Amazon, um, get in contact uh, with Dr. Harris um, for a signed copy. <laughs> it's wonderful that he's local and not like, you know, in Alaska or California. <laughs> so he, he, he's, he is local. Um, and everybody is just thanking you for the wonderful lecture. It was it was a it was it was a great enlightening lecture. I learned I learned a lot from the book and and the and the lecture because um, there are some things that uh, it was helpful to to hear it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be with you all this evening. I, uh, thank you for the invitation, Mary. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for uh, attending this. And someone, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put in, someone is coming from far away, <laughs> the LA Public Library. Um, they've requested a book there oh. to their uh, public library. So thank you for uh, attending from uh, the other coast. <laughs> All right, thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and everyone. Uh, have a great night. Don't forget to subscribe uh, to our e-newsletters for more events like this. Thank you again. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye.